Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Shlomi Dinar, and I'm the Associate Director of the School of International Public Affairs. Uh, as you all know, the Executive Director of SEPA, John Stack, he unfortunately could not be here with us today. He's traveling uh, and apologizes for not being in attendance. So I'm, of course, on honored to open this morning's event uh, in his stead. Uh, SEPA is thrilled to be partnering with the Miami Herald and El Nuevo Herald to discuss the most crucial element of our national politics and forthcoming national elections, the Latino vote. In addition, we are ecstatic to showcase not only the very best of our own SEPA faculty, but likewise pride, proud to join forces with faculty from FIU School of Journalism and Mass Communication, as well as the College of Law. All who are experts in the areas of American politics, the Latino vote, and election dynamics. Our gratitude also goes out to New Link Group, who conducted the poll and donated the sample we are about to hear about. A special thank you also goes out to Senior, Senior Vice President for External Relations, Sandra Gonzalez-Levy, for helping to make the poll possible. Before calling on Professor Eduardo Gamara to formally introduce the polling project, as well as the members of this esteemed panel, let me encourage all of you to learn more about SEPA, our activities and events, by simply going to international.fiu.edu. Very simple website. Uh, let me now introduce our moderator. Uh, Dr. Gamara is professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations. He's not only the author, co-author, and editor of several books and author of nearly 100 articles on Latin America and the Caribbean, but is a well-known authority on how politics in Latin America and the Caribbean affect U.S. policy. Dr. Gamara is also co-founder of Newling Group, a consulting firm dedicated to electoral and public policy campaigns throughout Latin America. In fact, Speaking to his expertise in elections and voting trends, you may have seen Professor Gamara most recently on Channel 7, analyzing the evening's debate between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney. Dr. Gamara, the floor is yours. Thank you much. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And thank you all for, uh, for joining us here today. I'm I'm thrilled uh, to be here. This is a, a project that, uh, uh, that we've been uh, working on very, very diligently in the, in the Department of Politics and International Relations. Um, th this idea sort of came to fruition as a result of conversations that I've been having with my colleagues over the last few months, and uh, uh, which basically uh, led us to ask the question, how is it that, uh, that uh, Latino politics uh, has had such very little coverage in, uh, in our own university, in our own department. So in, in some measure, our objective is to uh, set a precedent today by, uh, by um, conducting a survey both at the national level and in Florida, whose results I want to share very, very quickly. The idea is for me to go through these results as quickly as possible. I won't make any uh, comments interpreting them, but then I'll turn it over to this very distinguished panel, which I will introduce uh, uh, very, very briefly. Let me just say a couple of things about the survey first, and uh, uh, for, for, our, uh, for our, uh, uh, our objective, at least this morning, we want to understand how, why, and for whom Latino voters will vote on November 6th. But we also want to understand the differences, national and regional, and voter intention. Uh, primarily what we're saying is that there's a real difference here between uh, where you're from and how you're going to vote. And we'll see it sort of uh, very clearly in the results of the survey. And some of the expertise that we have around the table will be able to point out that much better than I will in these introductory remarks. How we did this survey is important, and just for, uh, just for uh, purposes of, of discussion, let me just introduce it. We've used a, a robotic uh, telephone system uh, uh, developed by, uh, by Newlink called the NewBot, uh, which basically uses software that incorporates the script of the questionnaire so that we are able to conduct um, the uh, interview in both English and Spanish and those responses are recorded directly into the database. This is a, a, a variation on the robocall. Um, we used for the calls, however, a company called Broadnet, 
which uses an IBM Blade Center, IBM Blade Center technology, uh, which really is quite fascinating. It's able to make about a million calls an hour. It can make as many calls as you want simultaneously. You, you're probably able to, to, uh, to make as many uh, simultaneous calls as, as, as you want. And, uh, uh, and frankly, those of you who are accustomed to receiving phone calls and hanging up, okay, <laughs> Uh, you, might, you might be amazed, however, that uh, how do we get to our random sample? How is it that we get our response rate? Well, we get such a volume of calls that we don't really worry about the representativeness of the, of the, of the sample. We, we end up uh, getting the, the number of calls that, that, uh, that we need. In this case, uh, we made uh, 10,248 calls in Florida, and we completed 720 interviews. Uh, the margin of error of the poll is 3.65 at the 95% confidence interval. The national sample, we made calls uh, throughout the country, only Hawaii we didn't call. Maybe we should have. Obama is from Hawaii, as you know. Uh, but we made 26,000 calls nationally, um, and uh, we had 10,000, uh, pardon me, 1,012 respondents. Um, 20% of both surveys were conducted in English. Only 20% chose to answer the, the, uh, the calls in English. 80% chose to answer the, 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 the survey in Spanish. Uh, the national survey has a, a smaller margin of error, 3.1, at the 95% confidence interval. The Miami Herald this morning said something which, uh, in fact, is, is kind of interesting to us at, at, at uh, the, the Politics and International Relations Department. According to uh, the Miami Herald, this is the first time that this kind of polling has done with Latinos, with Latinos in the United States. So, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, pleased that it, was, that it was us and that the results are so, uh, so interesting. So, so very quickly then, let me, let me just go through these uh, results. Uh, and as, as I said, I will not comment the results. I will just simply... Uh, note them as we as we go through, and then I'll turn it over to to the panel, which I will introduce in just a moment. Um, one more thing: Who, who's behind this poll? I don't know if you can see all those names up there, but just an awful lot of people have been involved in this. Uh, Dr. Stack and Sipa, uh, and Pedro Bota in particular, both were were instrumental in getting this team together, bringing together FIU Media Relations Office, which has just been spectacular. Maidel and John Paul. And, uh, and, uh, and Sandy Gonzalez. In my own department, I think everybody in the department pitched in in some measure. The people I'm listing here are simply the people who took their time and their, and in some cases, their voices. Um, uh, Dr. Arraraz, for example, is the voice of the, of the, of the Latino pulse. Uh, and Kimberly Noy, our secretary, is the, is the voice of the, of the, the American uh, voice there. Uh, but uh, just a, a number of faculty dedicated their time to this, to this poll, and I'm, I'm extraordinarily grateful to, to you. The Miami Herald, uh, several people, Mindy Marquez, uh, Jay Ducasi, Mark Caputo, Sergio Bustos, and others uh, who, who uh, worked with us. Uh, um, uh, first, they, they, uh, they contracted the, the, the poll, uh, and, and here, uh, you know, we're, we're we, we worked all weekend with, with them in getting, uh, in getting this, uh, this in, in place for this, in, in time for this morning's publication. So we're very grateful to them. And I also want to thank uh, Ivana Deza, uh, who's, uh, who's here from, from New Link Group, who uh, just uh, spent, uh, I can't tell you how many hours uh, processing the data and, uh, and going through, through all, of this, uh, all of this material. Uh, those of you who, who know how difficult it is to go from, from uh, from data to, uh, to paper, uh, uh, understand the, the value of Ivana's efforts. So, uh, so let me just then begin very quickly by, by going through this, uh, through this data. Uh, we have some data on certainty of, uh, this is a, a poll of registered Latinos uh, in the United States. So these are registered Latinos whom we asked, how likely are you to, to vote? And these are, these are the results. On the, on the left side, you'll see the, the Florida Latinos, on the, on the right, the, the U.S. Latinos. Um, do you remember for whom you voted in the 2008 elections, uh, both for, for both sides of the, of the uh, Florida and U.S.? Uh, and then we break it down, 
and I, I don't know how, if you can see very, very, very clearly there, but then we break it down by national or regional origin, Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Central American, and South American, okay, for both sides, and you'll see there that some very interesting observations can be made. With which political party do you most identify? Again, the, the breakdown uh, both uh, at, the, at, the, at the national and at the local level. I don't know why that, that one turned out twisted. I couldn't straighten it. <laughs> so you'll just have to do this. Uh, party identification now by, by uh, uh, regional or national origin. Again, the, the results by, in both. Uh, um, are you better off today than you were uh, four years ago? Um, and uh, here, I think that this will lead to some interesting discussion in just a few moments. Uh, Florida Latinos versus the national Latinos, with national Latinos feeling that, yes, they are better off. Uh, Florida Latinos, um, now breaking them down by groups again, you see some very interesting differences by, by, uh, by national or regional origin. Has President Obama fulfilled his promises to the Latino, to the Hispanic community? Uh, again, the breakdown, uh, and then by, by, uh, by different uh, uh, groups. Who will do a better job at fixing the U.S. economy, <coughs> President Obama or Governor Romney? And again, the results broken down that way and broken down by. Now, we have an extraordinary amount of data in this. In this. We, can also, we can also do, but just for, for purposes of discussion today, I, I, I selected these tables. We have the breakdown by religion. We have the breakdown by, by socioeconomic income, by age, by, by, uh, by gender. So, but simply for discussion today, I put these up. I imagine my panelists will, will, will want to uh, raise other questions about those distributions as well. Who's more capable of conducting foreign policy? Here, you go and see the, the difference. Uh, and the difference by, 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 by national origin. Uh, who will do a better job at immigration reform? I think this was sort of an expected result, but interesting in Florida how close Governor Romney is to President Obama. Uh, and, and then when you look at the breakdown by, by, uh, by ethnic group, you can also tell you know, the, the very distinct difference between uh, these two sets of, uh, of, uh, uh, of data. With which statement do you most agree? This is a question about the, the health care reform, and where, where we basically wanted to see you know, who wants to ditch it and who wants to keep it. And uh, again, very interesting, both the, the differences between the Florida poll and the national poll, and the difference by, by different ethnic groups, uh, by different uh, national origins, pardon me. And here's the, the one, of course, that, that most of you are, are interested in, uh, which is the voter intention. If the elections for, were held today, for whom would you vote? The, the Florida uh, sample, remember these are Hispanics in Florida, Latinos in Florida, uh, and elections uh, nationally, which basically shows you uh, a much broader difference. And when you look at this by, by national origin, it's not surprising to see, uh, again, what the, the very, very distinct difference. And, uh, um, and then this is a very, very local, the only, we, we were able to ask two, uh, two questions locally. Uh, for the U.S. Senate, uh, and uh, of course, Latinos, non-Cuban Latinos are, are a little bit more undecided about that vote than, than others, uh, than Cuban Americans. And do you agree with the Florida law that requires voters to show an ID? And, oh, it just says an ID. Uh, and here it's interesting because I'll just make one observation <coughs> here. I think that our our Anglo colleagues believe that we don't want that law to pass because somehow we want to get under the radar to vote. And this tells me very clearly that we're, we're quite comfortable with, uh, with this law because in fact, in our own countries, you have to show a national ID. There's no possibility of voting without a national ID. Um, finally, let me just say uh, we did you know, we obviously did weigh the sample. Uh, I tried, as you saw, if you, if you read the, the article in the Herald this morning, uh, we had to balance a little bit the, 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 the weight of several factors, uh, a regional weight. Miami-Dade County in Florida is an extraordinarily powerful uh, weight on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the vote in Florida. Uh, but I didn't want to uh, uh, weigh it by, uh, by, uh, by national origin. And so this is not a sample weighed by, uh, by Cubans. In fact, 
if I had weighed it more by Cuban, the, the vote for uh, President Obama would have been much higher. So, so I, I simply want to, want to point, point that out, okay? Um, so that's, that's the survey, um, and uh, let me now uh, introduce our speakers, and uh, what I will do is I'll introduce, uh, uh, I'll introduce them all right now, and then I will just simply call on you when, when it's time to speak. We'll, we'll begin with, uh, with Jose Miguel Cruz, uh, a, a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations. Uh, he was director of the, Institute of the University Institute of Public Opinion of the Univers Universidad Central uh, in, in San Salvador from 94 to 2006. Um, and probably when you, when you, when you, when you hear of, of Jose Miguel, he's best known for his extraordinary number of polls over the last 20 years. Um, and he's very involved right now with the Latin American Public Opinion Project out of Vanderbilt University, whom some of you know, and has worked very closely with Professor Seligson there. Jorge Duani, whom I, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to welcome uh, to, to FIU. Uh, Jorge Duani is our new uh, director of the Cuban Research Institute, uh, and he's professor of anthropology here as well. Before coming to, to FIU, he was the acting dean at the College of Social Sciences and professor uh, of anthropology at the Universidad de Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras, uh, and he had served where he'd also served as director of, of UPR's Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and he was also very well known because he directed the Revista de Ciencias Sociales. So, Jorge, bienvenido a, a Miami. Kevin Evans is also new here, and I'm, I'm also taking um, this opportunity to welcome him. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations. Um, he, his teaching interests in, in, uh, focus on the presidency, Congress, political parties, and he's particularly interested in interbranch relations and presidential power. So I couldn't think of anybody better to keep us honest, those of us who know less about American politics. Um, in case we get in legal trouble, we asked Jose Gabilondo, uh, who is now um, who is an associate professor of law at, uh, at, our, at our FIU College of Law. Uh, he came to us after a long career in, the financial, in financial market regulation at the U.S. Department of Treasury, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the Office of the Controller and Currency, and the World Bank. Uh, today, if any, if any of you turn on CNN in Español, you will see Jose Gabilondo is now FIU's face on, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on CNN and others. In fact, I was, I was just going to your, to your page the other day and I saw how many, how many interviews you've given uh, in the last uh, six months. So, uh, Professor Ray, uh, Nicol Ray, uh, who is our Senior Associate Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences, and he's a Professor of Politics and International Relations. Uh, Dr. Ray's research and teaching are focused on Congress, the presidency, and American political parties. The author of, of uh, books which have been quoted widely and uh, reviewed by the, by the New York Times Review of Books. He was awarded the, the, the Congressional Fellowship by the American Political Science Association, and he served as a Capitol Hill aide to Congressman George P. Radanovich of California and Senator T Tad Cochran of Mississippi. Again, to keep us honest on American politics, Dr. Ray, uh, thank you for joining us. Moses uh, Shomau uh, is uh, an assistant professor of journalism uh, um, and broadcasting in the School of Journalism and, and Mass Communications. His research focuses on the production and consumption of immigrant and Spanish language media in South Florida and nationally, as well as trends in conglomeration, news content, and political election coverage among leading national Spanish language media outlets. So that's your panel. They're, they know a lot more about this than I do, so I will turn it over to them now. And uh, uh, Miguel, shall we start with you? I know you have class too, so. <laughs> All right, bye. Thank you, Dr. Gamara. Thank you to SIPA for this opportunity. But this is a, a really wonderful source of information about the Latino voter here in Florida and uh, in the U.S. And I want, I, I'm going to be very brief. I just want to, <clears throat> uh, to show you some of the results to this question of who are the voters for Obama and who are the voters for Romney in Florida. I, I didn't have a chance to, to look at the, at the, the U.S., uh, at the national base. 
So I'm, 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 I'm focusing on, on, on the Florida one. So basically, I'm just going to show you some uh, multivariable uh, results on uh, the predictors of Hispanic bulk for Obama in Florida. And let me just start just uh, by explaining how to read this graph, right? In this graph, we have basically the, the coefficients. This is a, a logistic regression. Here you have the coefficients uh, of every variable here. And, and these dots show the coefficient for every variable. The red line shows basically the, the, um, uh, um, the significance. So to the extent that uh, at the dot is to the right, it's a positive relation. To the extent that the, the dot is to the left, is a negative relation. So what does it say this, basically? Well, it says that in terms of gender or age, we don't have that many uh, differences between those who vote for, for Obama. But the difference becomes very important when we take into account origin. Uh, and, and here, I basically divided the, the sample in two uh, large groups, Cubans and, no, and non-Cubans. And this is because, uh, as you saw in the presentation of uh, Dr. Gamara, uh, Cubans play an important role in the, in the vote intention here in, 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 in Florida. So you can see how, for instance, uh, no Cubans uh, have more, uh, a higher probability to vote for Obama than, in this case, Cubans. I also divided the, the, the sample in three different regions, Central Florida, South Florida, and the rest of Florida. Uh, and as you can see, uh, those who live in South Florida, basically, are not going to vote for Obama, basically. Hispanics vote, uh, that, that uh, Hispanics who live in, 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 in South Florida are less likely to vote for Obama. And then finally, Catholics. You can see Catholics over there. Uh, so again, I divided the sample between Catholics and the rest. And you can see how also uh, Catholics are less likely to vote for Obama uh, in Florida, at least Hispanic vote in, in Florida. Now, let's take a look to, to Romney. Again, with Romney, we see kind of a trend toward a uh, women's vote, but not significant. Uh, a little bit of those under 40 years old, uh, again, not significant. Those who are voting for, for Romney tend to be uh, um, between 41 and 65 years old. And definitely the most important variable here, again, are Cubans. So Cubans are overwhelmingly voting uh, for, for Romney in comparison with other, with other groups. Who are in the other, in, in the rest? Well, basically Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Central Americans uh, in the rest. And then you can see how also in Central Florida, well in Central Florida, Romney will not receive, that, will not receive as many Hispanic votes as in the rest of the, of, the, of the state. In South Florida, he will, to some extent, uh, and also Catholics, among Catholics. Romney is especially strong among Catholics, Cubans uh, in, in South Florida. So this gives us a you know, picture, a general broad, a broad picture of, uh, the, uh, of the voters uh, in the state of Florida for Hispanic. Let me just show you something, uh, something else to finish. And this is the vote shift 2008, 2012. So here you have the vote in 2008, and this is intention in 2012. As you can see, uh, those 84% 80, of those who voted for Obama in 2008 uh, will vote, or at least they say they will vote for Obama again. 15% is moving, uh, migrating to Romney, and only 1% is undecided. In the case of McCain, six, only 62% of those who voted for McCain are voting for Obama this time. Most of them are still uh, voting Republican, staying with the Republican. So it's a, it's a significant uh, 
fewer migration here in the case of, of the Republicans. But important data here is those new votes, those who didn't vote in 2008 and now are voting uh, in 65% for Obama, basically. So those new voters, those new Hispanic voters are moving toward uh, the Democratic Party and Obama more than to Romney. Uh, there is a, a small percentage of people undecided, but basically most of them are voting for uh, those new votes are, are going to, to Obama. So this, this, is one, uh, uh, this is what I have to show you. Uh, basically, it shows the importance of origin in the vote in, in, in Florida. And it puts Florida in certainly in a different, different behavior in comparison with other states and, and the general trend in, in, in the nation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Duani, shall we go with you next? Thank you to Eduardo Gamarra and also to Maire Santana for the kind invitation to participate in this panel. I have three major comments as director of the Cuban Research Institute, and I'm going to concentrate on some of the differences that have already been pointed out in terms of the Cuban and the Latino vote. First of all, I want to review some of the major consistent and, and sometimes growing differences among Cubans, both in Florida and in the rest of the United States compared to other Latinos, uh, particularly um, uh, Mexicans, Dominicans, and Puerto Ricans. Puerto Ricans. And then I want to speculate on some of the reasons why. Of course, that's not in the poll, but I think it begs the question of why is it the Cubans vote so differently uh, from the other Latino populations. And finally, I want to raise a number of issues that I think, since I didn't see the whole uh, um, information regarding the poll, uh, that I think uh, at least should be asked about uh, not only the question, the, the question of national origin differences, but also differences by education, by age, by generation, and so forth, because we do know from other information, especially the FIU Cuba poll that Guillermo Grenier has been conducted for a number of years, that Cubans are very diverse. And some of this diversity, I think, needs to be brought out um, in discussing the results. So first, the question of the differences. Uh, there are major differences, I think, in almost every um, uh, item that was presented here in terms of uh, the intention to vote for Obama or for Romney. Uh, and of course, Cubans tend to be much more favorable to Romney um, than they are toward Obama. Although surprisingly, the percentage of people of Cuban origin who say they're gonna vote for Obama remain the same. I think it's about 37%, so that's kind of interesting. Actually, what grew is the support for Romney compared to McCain in 2008. Uh, I didn't see many differences among Cubans in Florida and uh, the rest of the United States, but th those can be probably can be discussed later on uh, in the panel. Um, the question of um, reforms uh, under Obama, especially immigration reform and health reform, don't do as well for, uh, for Cubans uh, compared to other groups. Um, and so on, uh, support for foreign policy also is a major issue, and I think it's also one of the reasons why Cubans tend to favor the Republican Party. So I think in general, we find a, a very consistent, very uh, congruent uh, picture of Cubans tending to vote the Republican Party, and particularly uh, uh, Mitt Romney rather than President Obama. So why uh, is this uh, major difference uh, taking place, and why has it been so constant over the last uh, few decades? First of all, I think it has to do, as I mentioned before, foreign policy, and it's no secret that Cubans tend to favor the Republican Party because they perceive the Republican Party to be harder on Cuba and toward the Castro uh, government than the, uh, the Democratic uh, Party, and I think that's been a consistent reason why Cubans have tended to lean toward the Republican Party for many years. The second major reason has to, has to do with the question of values and conservatism in particular, Cubans in general tend to be more conservative than other Latinos, although it, it could also depend on the question being asked, whether it be abortion or whether it be uh, gay marriage and so forth. But in general, uh, Cubans tend to align themselves with the Republican Party because of the more conservative positions over these issues. And then the third one that doesn't come up so, uh, so often in discussions about the Cuban vote has to do with upward mo mobility, so that compared to other groups, other Latino groups, Cubans tend to do better off in terms of education, income, occupation. So I think if we could um, use that information and look at exactly what kinds of Cubans are voting for which party, we would see uh, that mostly it is the middle class and upper middle class people of Cuban origin who are favoring these uh, issues. 
So my final comment would, would have to do with uh, what kinds of other issues need to be raised, and I think precisely this question of diversity, the internal di differentiation by age, by birthplace, even by language, as we heard before, the fact that the poll was conducted mostly in Spanish, would tend to leave out uh, English-speaking bilingual, uh, even Spanglish-speaking uh, Cuban-American voters, and we know that they're very different from the older generation. Uh, the question of class that I already uh, raised before, even race, I don't know if that was a question in the poll, but we do uh, know that race tends to be uh, linked toward these political preferences. And in fact, I think uh, in, in some other information that I saw, uh, Romney tends to do much better among white uh, people in general, so it wouldn't be a surprise to see that Cuban Americans, who are predominantly white in this country, uh, would favor uh, that, uh, that party. Uh, question of location, as I said before, I couldn't really tell major differences between Cubans living in Florida, even South Florida as opposed to Central Florida, and the rest of the country, and we do know that there are major differences uh, in many in many ways, and including um, political differences. Uh, so those are, would be the kinds of issues that I would like to look at more closely when we get the, the full results of the poll, and then compare them to other um, research that has been done both at here at FIU and elsewhere. Um, one um, other question that I have, I have two more, uh, has to do with the question of the reaction to President Obama's uh, uh, easing of the restrictions for travel and remittances, which took place over the past uh, four years. Uh, from what we know, uh, the Cuban-American community tended to favor these uh, um, changes in, in policy, but we don't know uh, how that will affect uh, this election. Uh, and again, uh, I wouldn't expect all Cubans to, to feel the same way. We do have a split in terms of uh, the community, whereas uh, some members of the community want to travel to Cuba, want to send remittances, want to keep in touch, and yet there are other people, probably the ones who are voting against Obama uh, in, this, in this poll. Uh, a third issue has to do with citizenship, registration, and voting. And of course, since the poll was restricted to re uh, registered voters, then the question becomes how would other people, once they become uh, American citizens and once they become able to, to vote and register, how would they participate? So we, we do see, I think, a growing trend uh, in the Cuban American community to become more diverse and again, to favor more uh, the Democratic Party than before. And finally, uh, one, one intriguing question has to do with self-perception. And one of the major differences that I saw in the poll was, had to do with the self-perception of not being better off uh, among Cubans. 63% 63 63 of all Cubans said they weren't doing better now than they were four years ago, uh, compared to 46% of Latinos in Florida. So the question then becomes, what is it about uh, the past four years that Cubans perceive to be uh, a, a something of a, um, you know, a, a problem for them, uh, is it economics, is it politics, is it the way that the Obama administration has handled the Cuban uh, foreign policy, we don't know. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Evans? Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming. And um, I just wanted to make four really quick points, okay? Um, the first point I wanted to make uh, has, well, the first three points all have to do with this gap, okay? The gap, the 16-point gap that we see in vote intention between the national poll and the Florida poll. The simplistic explanation for that gap, um, and one that's probably largely accurate, is that Cuban Americans play a big role here, and they do. Um, but there's a little bit more nuance to that explanation, and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about that from what we've seen in the poll. So um, we see some differences. We see some, some drops in support across the other subgroups as well. So when we compare the national sample to the state sample, um, for instance, um, the Mexican origin group uh, has a decline of 13%, the Puerto Ricans, uh, 9%, Dominicans, 8%, Central Americans, 10%, South Americans, 19%. So we see these large drops in support for President Obama in Florida across all of these different groups. So um, it's more, there's more going on than just Cubans supporting Romney here. Um, Obama is seeing less support among, amongst these groups. Um, and then my second and third points might help us get to a little bit of a reason why some of that is happening. 
uh, and, and this is tentative, of course, because uh, we've only seen so much of the data so far. But uh, the second point has to do with probably the most stark contrast that I saw in the poll. And that has to do with um, respondents of Mexi uh, Mexican origin. So we asked this question, okay, uh, how uh, has Obama fulfilled his promises to the U.S. Hispanic community? Okay, has Obama fulfilled his promises to the U.S. Hispanic community? And in the national poll, the Mexican origin group um, responded 46% yes. Yes, Obama has. Okay. 20% no, or 33% no, and 20% said some. Okay, some. Uh, in regard to the, uh, the Mexican origin in Florida, we see a very stark contrast, and it, it was by far the biggest contrast that I saw in the poll. So in response to this question about Obama keeping his promises to the Hispanic community uh, in Florida, it's 15% yes. So um, we move from 46% nationally to 15% uh, in Florida, 31 point difference on that question. So um, there's something going on with um, the Mexican origin group within Florida. Um, and uh, the, ne the next uh, point that I wanted to make has to do with the economy and questions that we asked about the economy. And what we saw is that most Latino uh, subgroups in Florida feel less confident about Obama's ability to, f uh, Obama's ability to fix the economy um, when compared to the national sample. So once again, we see these drops from the national sample to the Florida sample about confidence in the ability of President Obama to fix the economy. Um, the Mexican group um, dropped, declined 25 percent, Puerto Ricans 9 percent, Central Americans 10 percent, South Americans 20, 23 percent. It's important to note that all four of these groups are still above a majority, okay? So they're still supporting President Obama. They, they still uh, feel that President Obama can, um, you know, uh, fix the economy, but um, there's stark differences between the Florida sample and the national sample. And the very last point that I wanted to make has to do with um, the sex of the respondents. And across uh, at least the questions that I was able to look at, we don't see any major differences in the opinions of Latino men and women um, on these questions we're asking on, on these various policy issues. And it's uh, sort of interesting because we typically in national polls uh, that look at a, you know, a broad representative sample of the nation uh, typically see gender gaps. And uh, we don't see that here. Uh, and a big part of that is probably that um, we don't have uh, you know, white males that tend to uh, favor the Republican Party that create part of that gap in national polls. Uh, and the very last point I wanted to make is that um, that, that, that point that I made about econo economics is probably connected back to that gap that we see um, in terms of support for Obama overall, uh, in terms of vote intention, uh, because economic perceptions play a very large role in the way that people vote. Professor Gavilondo. Thank you very much for including me, Eduardo, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. <clears throat> I don't have any sophisticated statistical analysis, I'm just a lawyer. <laughs> but I'm going to frame my comments more about the politics of polling, and I'm not going to repeat some of the other findings that have been, um, that have been, uh, that have been made. Um, it's an excellent poll, and I'll tell you why it's excellent in a minute, but I want to frame the poll in a, in a trend that I see in the election this year. And that is, uh, it, it relates, it, it's an analogy to what, uh, what Eisenhower noticed when he stepped down from the presidency. He'd been a general. And he looked out at the country and he said, you know, there's this thing developing, the military industrial complex. What I detect this electoral season is something akin to that, which I think of as the media electoral complex. And it's driven by a couple of things. One, within the media industry, there's anxiety about business models and uncertainty about what shape the media will take in the future. So the media is looking for ways of protagonizing, and it wants to become more important. And on the electoral side, you have an important decision that came down in 2010, Citizens United, which largely 
eliminated <coughs> federal and state restrictions on campaign finance. And, we all, and, and if we didn't have an electoral market before Citizens United, we really have one now. And what Citizens United does is create, I think of it as demand side financing for polls, experts, analysis, this whole media sector that purports to tell you something about reality. And, uh, and I, I think examples of it that you see are like the, the, the number of, uh, of CNN debates this year for the Republican uh, candidate. I mean, that was very interesting. And just the, the volume of media coverage, and you know, I'm guilty of that myself. It's something that I think is very interesting. Um, and, I, and I think the consequences of this sector is that uh, the media gets to decontextualize candidates and creates its own reality. So a candidate can be made or broken based on a single debate that has nothing to do with his personal history, his party's history, any correspondence to who he is. Now, I think it's, you know, we're, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. That, that's where we find ourselves. And I think part of, part of why we're there is I think maybe it was incremental, but I think it started with Sarah Palin. And I think in a world where Sarah Palin could be rendered a plausible candidate, then it's, you've entered a new reality, one that you have to understand on its terms. Now, given that, that's a, critical, that's a critical take on polling realities. Given that, why do I think this is a good poll? Well, because this is a tool for combating nativist representations of Latino identity in what is still an Anglo-dominated media environment. And why I think this is such a good poll, and it's, it reminds me of Guillermo Grenier's Cuba poll, and I hope that it is repeated in the same, I hope that it is institutionalized in the same way that Guillermo's poll is institutionalized, because this poll is very much an, an inside look at Latino identity. It's not an outside look at who we are. And when you look inside, what you immediately are confronted with are contradictions and the need to distinguish between US Latinos and Florida Latinos. And then within that, national distinctions. You could use that same model maybe to look at California, the Southwest. You could use a similar multi-ethnic, multi-regional model to look at other communities. And because I think that is so good, I, I wish there were a way of whatever the, the findings are, pushing the methodology of the poll as a, as a best practice or as a particularly ethical way of dealing with um, a, very, a very complex ethnic reality. So, that's, so what I like most about the poll is the structure of it and, um, the, and, and the way that I think it really honors the, the complexity, the self-problematizing nature of Latino, of Latino identity at this moment. So that's why I think it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful poll. Um, now, the, I guess the one thing that, I, that, I, that surprised me in particular was the, the voter registration law. I was disappointed <laughs> that Latinos were so supportive of these voter registration law. I really uh, appreciated uh, Dr. Gamata's observation that given the context of electoral fraud in Latin America, that, that that's one reading. But I, but I think what that told me is that there needs to be more education about the U.S. context of, of electoral fraud, of which there's very little, and the U.S. history of voter suppression. And I would think it would be easy for Latin Americans who are you know, familiar with this idea that quien hace la ley hace la trampa. And, and I would think there'd be a way of reframing <laughs> those voter registration <laughs> programs in that, uh, in that vein. So anyway, I, um, I don't have much else to add, just that I think it's a very important poll. It's a way of assuming uh, res responsibility in this, in this new media world. And I'm very happy that FIU did it. I'm not surprised. It's exactly the kind of thing <laughs> that I think FIU uh, is all about. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gamara. Um, I don't pretend to be an expert on Latino politics, but um, I am delighted, actually, to see this poll, and uh, kudos to Dr. Gamara and uh, Dr. Cruz and all the others who worked on it. I mean, we see so much uh, talk or chatter, uh, to be more pejorative, um, in the media and in public opinion about the Hispanic vote, the Latino vote, and, you know, the assumption that this is a monolith. W uh, what your poll shows, I think, quite brilliantly is that it is not. 
and that if you break them by national origin, you see some very critical differences, which I think are electorally very significant, given that uh, Florida, where most of the Cuban um, American voters are concentrated, is such a critical state uh, in the electoral college. Um, one point that, and I mean, you know, I'm, I, I must admit I haven't absorbed all the data, um, but it, it comes to something that uh, Jose Miguel raised on Catholicism and how you measured that. Where you measure, I, I'd be interested to hear, and you can say later, if you were looking at the intensity, of, because we know there's a clear re relationship between the intensity of religious observance and uh, Republican voting that pretty much holds across most uh, groups in the US. Um, where I've seen data that it breaks down a little bit actually is among Mexican Americans. Um, and then I've seen other data looking at Protestant evangelical Latinos who are not an insignificant number in many places, which indicates that they tend to be more Republican, more politically conservative. And remembering certainly debates about the gay rights ordinance in Dade County a few years ago that Latino evangelicals were very prominent in the, on the anti side on that. Um, but leaving that aside, I, I have some general observations, I think, about the Hispanic vote and misconceptions that are out there. Um, there is um, another very popular theory, I think, among Democrats for understandable reasons but also in certain circles of the media and among political scientists, um, which um, basically says that uh, demography is destiny and that there's an emerging democratic majority based on demographics. And a major plank of that argument is a continually growing Latino share of the electorate, uh, you know, sort of condemning the Republican Party uh, into a sort of declining white share and sort of knocking the balance of the Electoral College decisively in favor of the Democrats. Um, as uh, th there is something to this, but I have a lot of caveats. Uh, when we talk about the Hispanic vote, for a start, I mean, presidential elections are conducted in the Electoral College, for better or worse. And 40% of the Hispanic vote is in two states that are not competitive, California and Texas. I think if you threw in New York, the percentage would probably go up to about 50. So, I mean, it is possible for us, to, I think, to exaggerate the impact of the Latino vote, given the electoral college system of electing the president, is actually, um, I think, in this election, limited to about three swing states. Florida, obviously the largest and most critical um, state, um, and also, the two western states of Colorado and Nevada, key swing states where the Hispanic vote is very important. Um, possibly Arizona, although I, my suspicion is that if we have a close national election, Arizona still um, goes Republican. But there may be some long-term potential to turn that into a swing state based on the Latino vote. We shall see. Um, at any rate, uh, the assumption that the Latino vote is on a aggressive growth pattern in terms of share of the electorate is actually not accurate. Um, in 2004, the Latino vote was about 8.24% of the electorate. In 06, it was 7.94. In 08, it was 8.38. And 2010, about 8%. Um, there was a significant decrease in the white vote in 2008 which undoubtedly helped President Obama, but most of that came from a surge in the African-American percentage of the vote, which grew from about <coughs> 10 to 13 percent. Um, and was very important in several states that swung uh, Democratic in that year, Virginia, North Carolina in particular. Um, so I think, um, you know, we need to be a little careful when we see those arguments in the media and, uh, you know, by, uh, in sort of op-ed columns um, about the surging Latino vote. And remember also, of course, that, Lati that you know, Mexican-American immigration into the U.S. Has, has stalled in the past few years for a number of reasons, primarily, I would think, economic, um, which also, you know, puts some more perspective um, on that. 
Uh, nevertheless, I mean, um, for the Republicans, there is a problem with the Latino vote, which your poll brings out. It may give them some encouragement here in Florida, but um, they, you know, they have not made up the ground that they lost after the 2004 election when uh, George W. Bush, uh, you know, got about 40% of the Latino vote overall. Um, and George W. Bush, whatever else you may think of him, you know, made no secret of the fact that he was uh, basically pro significant immigration reform, which would involve, involve some degree of amnesty uh, for you know uh, undocumented uh, immigrants still in the country. Um, and there has been kind of a Texas tradition of that, which also surfaced, if you'll remember, in the Republican primaries, where Rick Perry. Uh, ended up being regarded as a total softy on immigration, uh, where he indicated support basically for Texas's version of the DREAM Act, um, and got thoroughly clobbered by the other Republican candidates, particularly Mitt Romney. And I think Newt Gingrich on one occasion, you know, evinced somewhat more pragmatic position on immigration reform, and again, Mitt Romney pounced on him. Um, and I think to some degree, Governor Romney is paying the price in the primaries, he went way out on immigration issues and I think, you know, alienated a potential Latino vote that, that might have come back to him this fall, and which I think your poll still shows, um, isn't going to come uh, outside, the, outside the Cuban American vote. So um, they have a problem uh, that they, they need to think about, at least on the national level. Um, I mean, one indication of it is the state of New Mexico which in, in 2000, 2004, was a very competitive state. And Bush actually won it in 04. Uh, the Republicans elected a governor there in 2010. Uh, New Mexico this year is not a swing state. Uh, and a very strong Republican Senate candidate is going down by about 10 points. So, I mean, that's an indication, I think, of you know, the damage and a potential hole, which if Republicans keep digging, could uh, contribute to bringing the Tahara and Judas uh, sort of prophecy uh, of an emerging democratic uh, party um, <laughs> enable that to come to pass. I'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Ray, for those great comments. And now we end with uh, Professor Moses Schumacher. Uh, good morning, uh, and thank you for the invitation from BBC up north to come and join you down here. <laughs> I appreciate that. <clears throat> I just have a quick a few comments, um, and Jose sort of already started talking about the role of media and all of this, so I'm going to continue a little bit on where he started. Um, first of all, to hear that 80% of these interviews were conducted in Spanish is, is fascinating to me and a great uh, for my research <laughs> because I study Spanish language media. And in particular, I study those outlets that serve different Spanish-speaking communities. And so when I see the results from a poll like this and the interesting differences that exist amongst these communities, um, somebody mentioned the conservative of, of Mexican population here and their affiliation with you know, the Romney regarding versus the national poll, right? And so these differences are really fascinating to me because then I relate that back to, well, where is the quality? What is the information that they're getting? Where is it coming from? What are the outlets that are serving these communities? So overall, I just find that fascinating for my own interest in the research direction that I'm headed in. Um, I thought oh, uh, one thing that stood out that hasn't been mentioned yet was just, and I'm going to try to relate all my comments back to sort of the implications for media, media coverage, political ads, et cetera, is the number of, of voters in Florida, of Hispanic voters with no party affiliation, um, was uh, marked three times, in some cases, difference amongst the different subgroups, you know, which it didn't, doesn't mark them as independents, but it marks them as not being completely uh, affiliated, right? And so I think that increases Florida's importance as a swing state where we're thinking about these populations and those numbers of, of Hispanic voters that are not affiliated with one party or another. And then that, in turn, uh, will really increase, I think, the number of Spanish language political ads we're going to be seeing uh, from both sides to try to get those voters and understand those who are not completely tied down yet, how are we going to get them? Because as Jose mentioned, su the super PACs have created a $10 billion election, right? Double the amount of money that was spent in 2008. Um, and yet, when you think about the number of voters that are actually being targeted by that $10 billion, it's incredible, right? And so I think this is really important when we think about what the media landscape in South Florida and the rest of Florida is going to look like, particularly among Spanish language media outlets. 
Um, and then also, I, you know, I'm always interested in sort of the quality and the nature of information that Spanish language uh, voters and citizens and consumers are receiving in media outlets and, and how that affects, you know, uh, opinions about important issues. And so uh, uh, Jose mentioned as well the, the, the pretty drastic results on the voter ID law. And, and that, you know, 80% overall in favor of something along those lines, which, which is remarkable. And I think that, as uh, Dr. Gamara pointed out, I think that nat national origin and, and cultural background could explain some of this. But that seems like a pretty big gap. And I wonder about the quality of coverage of what these voter ID laws are about, especially their implications for minor minority voters, right? Um, there's been a lot of reporting uh, in English, not received a lot of information or a lot of coverage by the mainstream media, and yet um, these are important issues. And so I, I, I see something like that, and I think, well, so what's, what information is out there? What exists in the Spanish language media outlets if 80% of these uh, respondents chose to respond in Spanish? I assume that a lot of their media comes from Spanish media, right? And so this, this is important, I think, to think about. Um, as well as the Senate race, you know, I mean, I saw the, the results was, you know, 30% didn't know who they were going to vote for. This is a national, you know, this is a, you know, that we have two senators, right? This is an important position. There's only 100. And so if, if, if people are saying they just don't know between Bill Melson and Connie Mack, it could be that they just, but these are pretty two distinct candidates, right? You, you know, so it's, it's surprising to me that over a third of the people who responded uh, don't know who they're going to vote for. So either they really don't know between these two guys or there's just not a lot of coverage and that that race isn't being covered well or given a lot of context or, or enough information about these candidates so people can make an informed decision on who they want to vote for. Okay, so, so this is something else I think that I got out of that result. Um, and, and, you know, just moving forward, I think it's, it's fantastic, a poll like this that tries to break away from a homogenizing term of Latino voters or Hispanic voters. Uh, uh, as we know, this is a population that's going to have more and more importance in our elections moving forward, that we try to break away and are breaking away from these terms that kind of lump people together, which, which emerge out of the media. Right, which is very easy to sort of take terms like that and group people together because then it's easier to cover them, it's easier to sort of apply sort of broader paintbrushes. Uh, uh, and yet uh, a poll like this very clearly shows, as you look at some of the numbers, um, I've only had about 12 hours and six of those were done sleeping, so, but uh, uh, to, to look at them and, and see like the differences between Mexicans in Florida versus national, between Puerto Ricans, um, you know, the Cubans, again, we see historically and in this one are, tend to be the, the outlying group, right, but important group, uh, and yet those other differences are incredibly important and, and that's kind of what I'm trying to focus on moving forward in terms of understanding their media information uh, consumption. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank uh, all of you for taking uh, the time to, uh, to read the poll, to uh, uh, sort of absorb it in, in the last few hours because we've literally just finished. Um, so thank you very much. You, you're all very, very busy people, and I really appreciate the effort you, you put into coming this morning. And all of you in the audience, of course, as well. And so what I'd like to do now is open it up for uh, questions from the floor. And just to show you how we are connected at this university and we're worlds ahead, uh, we are also are taking questions over the Internet. So, uh, so yes. And if you would, uh, when you stand, if you would identify yourself so we know who you are. And hmm? well, there's a there's a mic over there. I guess we should go to because uh, otherwise we can't uh, we can't tape. Right. Thanks. Maybe you want to make a line behind the. What percentage of the of the Latin population in Florida are Cubans? That's number one. Number two, when the poll is taken about health care, is the question what do you think of health? health care, are you for or against it, or do they ask specifics of the health care? Because that is a very important question rather than the generalization of are you for or against it. Uh, just but, oh, Anybody, but... Uh, just to answer one of those questions uh, about the health care, uh, the health care question was general. Uh, so if I remember correctly, it just, it just asked... Um, uh, are you are you in agreement with a statement basically right are you right. yeah of asking that well actually uh, i i think there's a 
there's a politics and a review that you could have of every question, but one reason why it's okay to frame it that way is because that's the dominant media framing. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to set up a dialectic where this poll, the, these poll results are going to be talking to the other poll results, you have to match the, uh, you have to match the, the question. I agree. There, I mean, I sort of thought, I, I had a similar reaction to the question, are you better off than you were four years ago, especially because that's a question that's come from the Republican side. And my reaction is always, well, wait a minute, that's a very statist question. Whether you're better off or not depends on you know, your own virtues and your own hard work. Are you suggesting that the president has something to do with whether you're better off? So I, I think that's one reason why, why that, that, that <laughs> phrasing is OK. Well, well, I agree. It would be useful to see, okay, who's against, who, who favors coverage for pre-existing conditions? Who favors, you know, um, you know uh, being able to cover your kids? That, that, that's useful, but I think that's a separate question. I think this question is useful because there's already some data on this question. Well, the question is now, whoops, it's not up there, but it's over there. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> let, me, let me just say a couple of things for, for, your, for your information. I mean, clearly, you know, um, we are, in some measure, limited by the methodology, all right? Remember, this is, a, this is a telephone call, and it's a robotic telephone call, right? So um, that's our, for our, our, our limitation is that, uh, as I said at the, at the outset, sometimes, uh, you know, people don't, don't like staying on the phone that long. Uh, even though we had, uh, you know, a very, very uh, significant voice there who's just now leaving us uh, um, and who sounds like like uh, you know who sounds just like her sister who's a very very popular person in the US we thought you know for sure they're they're not going to hang up on us but uh, but uh, <laughs> she's sneaking out now but uh, but the, the the reality is that you you know uh, we, we couldn't make that many questions number one number two um, and I would love you know because it's it's really a question of cost. I mean, this, this is a question of cost. The more questions we ask, uh, the more costly the, the, the poll is. And, uh, um, and then, so on the, on the healthcare question, we really struggled with this. And, and I mean, it was several of us coming together and trying to see how we would, we would write this question. And, and, you know, the direct question would have been, you know, should you abolish it? But basically what we crafted were three statements that kind of capture what's out there right now as, as uh, uh, Jose Gabilondo said in the media. And these, these things were, you know, President's health, uh, President Obama's health care plan. We didn't call it Obamacare, even though President Obama now has, has adopted that as a, as, a, as a symbol. We've said, should President Obama's health care plan be kept? We said only parts of it should be kept, or the program should be entirely eliminated. And we basically asked with which of these were you in agreement. So it's, you're right, I mean, the question could be, could be better, and we could go further in detail, but uh, given the limitations of what we were doing, this is the best we could do. Dr. Grenier? Guillermo Grenier, don't apologize for your poll. It's a great poll. <laughs> 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 but on the question, it's always, I mean, regarding that question, I think that, that questions like this measure extremes, who's for and who's against, then you're less likely to know and it's not an educational poll. You, they're not out there to educate the people as to the issues. That would be a push poll. So I think you know you can't have it all, but what you got is good. Um, the I'm going to make three brief comments. One is on the registration um, issue uh, Cu and Cuban Americans specifically. That's what I'm going to address uh, most specifically. Identity and registration in the Republican Party are cl closely tied right. in the Cuban community. And um, besides the polling data that shows that, I was out there interviewing uh, folks at the uh, Occupy events in Miami. And I did a bunch of interviews. And they all were giving me very, uh, most of the questions they were giving me very right on, kind of radical, the rich are getting too rich, so things that make me, me warm and cozy inside, you know, when I hear <laughs> it from a young Cuban. Um, the, so they were, they were giving me the, the rap, the Occupy rap until I got down to what party you registered in. And overwhelmingly, 
Cuban Americans that had a great anti-capitalist rap were still registering Republicans. <laughs> so uh, that's the conflict that's that we see in, in, in a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. So you, yeah, you see that. Interesting. And then the the other thing is that res registration is um, not only is a part of identity, but it's part of identity at, at another level, which is a lot of Cubans aren't registering. The, uh, since 1994, 35% of Miami Amer Cuban Americans in Miami have come since 1994. And 60% of those um, are, uh, only 60% of those are citizens. And of, of those, only 40%, 35% are registered. So the, uh, the registration is that identity is at, at a very deep, deep, deep level. And what, one thing that surprised me was the, um, the Catholic response, mm -hmm. you know, which kind of, you know, reinforced my belief that Catholics don't care about religion, including their own. So uh, <laughs> they're, they're both for a Mormon. Sure, why not? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, interesting. Any, any, uh, <laughs> uh, I won't answer that one. Anybody on the, on the panel? <laughs> Anybody have anything to say to, the, to that comment? My only comment is anecdotal, but uh, when I was looking at these last night, uh, my wife is the daughter of Cuban Americans, uh, Cuban immigrants, and she was born here. And I said, wow, even still, you know, even with all the talk that we've had about the younger generations and, you know, people becoming maybe more liberal or the second generations leaning more democratic, you look at these and you say, well, but no, you don't see that here. And she said, yeah, but I think about all the friends I grew up with, you know, their parents were really strong Republicans going way back. And it's in, you, you don't, those things don't change overnight. They don't happen that quickly. And she said, when I think of the group I grew up with, they, even if their sort of, their political leanings have shifted, they'll still, uh, they identify as Republicans. And so it's, it's I think it's just speaking to what uh, Guillermo yeah. was saying. No, and, and uh, you know, our, our uh, Cuban, uh, American faculty or Cuban faculty, I guess, uh, has been really looking at this for a number of years. I mean, for how long, Guillermo, did we talk about? You know, there is a generational shift, you know, and and then and then Elian occurred, and we 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 decided that there was no shift, and so so it's it's kind of an interesting, you know, uh, but what it does give me the warm and cozy feelings or fuzzy, whatever you said, is that uh, that there there's so much stuff. Here in the, in this poll that I think is 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 beginning to generate a discussion among us, uh, which really has to do with you know let's let's do some more in depth interviews let's do some some other other kinds of research that supplements this. Um, I was thinking about uh, uh, Daniel Cleland, another one of our colleagues, for example, uh, and uh, and uh, Barry Levitt in the back. He was there at least. Uh, well, oh, there he is. Uh, you know they were very interested in two things. They were interested in trust, and they were interested in race. And so, you know, we went around, developed the questions and everything else, and then guess what I had to do? I had to, I had to just, because they simply wouldn't fit into the, into the questionnaire. So, so there's a, just an awful lot of different nuances here that we should be studying and that we will now that we have this particular tool. So uh, let me go to a, another question there, and then I'll take one from, uh, from the Internet. Okay? Go ahead. Really, good morning. Vicente Shepard, Reading and Learning Within Undergraduate Education. Um, incidentally, I grew up in a split Mexican-Cuban household. Uh, my <laughs> father's Mexican, my mother's Cuban, so politics were always a little interesting at home. Um, when I was doing some business over in California, I noticed that there was an article about um, tomato growing and tomatoes being supplied from Mexico into the United States and how the state of Florida is one of the largest growers of tomatoes within the country and how right now there's a, a huge um, discourse between whether or not the country should allow Mexico to continue to export their tomatoes, um, which the qualitative research meant that they're tastier, they're larger, they, you know, they let the, the tomatoes ripen as opposed to the Florida tomatoes that are, they pick them green, they inject them with some red color and then they sell them. So what got my attention was the Florida Mexicans, where obviously they are the ones growing the Florida tomatoes, um, what their perspective is on this as opposed to Mexicans outside of the state of Florida who are now looking at the import-export implications of things like agriculture and how that would affect these polls. Just wanted to get your take on how things like import-export how much the Mexican population, how much the Cuban population pays attention to this and whether that played an effect as to how they responded 
to the poll? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to take a, a stab at it because the poll didn't take that into account at all. Okay, I mean, that, that, that's the answer. But, uh, but I think your question raises a, a number of different uh, interpretive uh, issues that some of you may want to take. Anybody? Um, I would just say that unless they're directly involved in the industry that's being affected, they're probably not paying attention. Um, that, that's what I would think. <laughs> but uh, obviously, I don't have any uh, data to back that up or anything. But um, th th I think that would be the case. So for, for those in, in, you know, in Florida that are directly involved in tomato growing, yeah, sure, they probably are affected by that. But um, outside of that community, uh, it's probably not influencing um, others. So. You know, about eight, about eight years ago, LAC conducted a, uh, a series of focus groups around the state with Mexicans and sort of trying to see, because in, in, the, in the 2000 census, the Mexican population in Florida had grown 120% relative to the, the decade, the prior decade. That growth has slowed down somewhat. So in some measure, one of the most understudied segments in Florida is, is the Mexican population. And so uh, I, I can't remember if it was uh, uh, Dr. Evans or somebody who pointed out, you know, why is it that on, uh, for example, whether President Obama has betrayed us, right, or has not uh, satisfied us, why is it that, that Mexicans in Florida are different than Mexicans nationally? Maybe por ahí va la cosa, right? Okay. All right. Uh, let me take one, let me just have you stand for just a moment. Uh, let me go to, uh, to Twitter. Uh, <laughs> regarding Cuban voters, uh, this is for the panel. If immigration policy were to change for Cubans, do you suspect more would change voting patterns? Regarding Cuban voters, if immigration policy were to change for Cubans, do you suspect more would change voting patterns? Interesting. Professor Duani, it seems to me that no. you're... Well, it's an intriguing question. I'm not sure I, I, I understand exactly the meaning of it, but there's, it, there doesn't seem to be a correlation between the two, the, the immigration status of, of Cubans and their mm -hmm. voting patterns. Uh, however, I would expect that uh, were Cubans to change their legal status in the United States, and right now the status, as many of you know, is uh, different from uh, all other uh, immigrant groups because uh, Cubans are allowed to enter the country if they uh, touch um, touch land as opposed to other groups that are deported. Uh, however, it does, there doesn't seem to be any uh, immediate evidence that that's going to happen anytime soon, either from the Republican side or the, or the uh, Democratic side. So what is, I think, uh, reflected in the poll is the fact that Cubans do not think that immigration reform is a major uh, achievement of the uh, Obama administration. But again, also for Cubans, this doesn't seem to be a primary uh, reason why they would vote for one party or another. Anybody else? Well, I, um, yeah, I, I, it's an ambiguous question. But uh, the way I understand it is the immigration reform they're talking about is the repeal of wet foot, dry foot, so Correct. that it would be harder for Cubans who come here to enter the, um, to enter the society and, and, and acquire rights. And I, and I, and I, and I would assume that what, what that's suggesting is that part of the reason for limiting, uh, limiting that is that the kinds of Cubans who are coming here now they're no longer Cold War trophy Cubans. <laughs> I mean, the Cubans coming in today aren't the, you know, it's like it's not my old miss anymore. And so, and I think they're, the new Cubans are contributing to these demographic changes we've seen in the Cuba poll. And so, uh, and so I assume that, that maybe the, the hope of some is that if you, if you limit immigration, you'd freeze that, mm -hmm. you'd freeze those changes. Interesting. Okay. Yes. Hi, my name is Alexis Cladiud. I'm a first year political science major. And my question, um, to my understanding, um, Latinos are more traditional in values. Um, and that's my first question. Is that just the Cubans or is that every, everybody? And my second, um, are Latinos, if that's true, are Latinos focusing on specific pet issues or are they taking on media perception of parties? Question. Anybody want to address that, Jose Miguel? Yeah, according to some other surveys, yeah, Latinos tend to be more more traditional and 
more conservative in terms of, of values. But that doesn't translate into voting behavior, and that, uh, that doesn't make them basically to move to the republic. And basically because for many Latinos, uh, the issue of values, or social values especially, is usually divorced from politics, right? They, they vote uh, on politics based on other things, not based on values, it seems. And, and, and you can see that in, in, to some extent in this, in this, in this survey. So, so yes, that's that one of the reasons. I ju and just wanted to take this opportunity to jump into some of the comments of, of, of Kevin about the difference between the Hispanos, Hispanics here in, in Florida and, and, and the rest of the country. And I would say that if you, if you split uh, Florida, basically, between South Florida and the rest of Florida, basically what you see is, is this very stark difference between South Florida and the rest of Florida. Basically, if you take the rest of Florida, the rest of Florida behaves as most of the country. Mm. Uh, so, so the, the big difference in terms of, 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 of Latino voting uh, takes place here in South Florida, sorry, and especially in Miami-Dade. Because for instance, if you take only Central Americans living in Miami-Dade and South Florida, Central Americans tend even to vote more Republican than, 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 than in, other, in other places. Or, or so that's an interesting you know, split. And my second question is, um, is that not voting for values? Is that concerned with pet policies like immigration, for example, or um, or media perception of parties? What, why, basically? Or I, I would say there are other surveys. This this particular survey, of course, doesn't com uh, compare Latinos with non-Latinos, but other surveys have shown that the three major issues for Latinos and the rest of the population are very similar. So their education, health, and the economy, and then immigration has fallen behind. Uh, as a sort of Latino issue, it still is more important for Latinos than for other groups, mm -hmm. but there doesn't seem to be a major difference in terms of political attitudes at, at this point. Yeah, let me let me just add a little bit to, to what has been said on this particular issue, because I think there's some very interesting data out there from other polls, in particular the Latin American Political Opinion Project uh, that, uh, that Jose Miguel is involved in and, and others here. Uh, but also, uh, just, to, just to tell you something that's quite interesting, which, which uh, the people at La Pop are calling it the, the inverted civic culture, right? Uh, which is kind of interesting because, you know, for many, many years, those of us who are political scientists were trained with this idea that, you know, the civic culture was basically sort of, you know, the United States because of, you know, high levels of trust in, uh, in institutions and, 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 and political institutions mainly. Do you know what's happened in, in, in most recent public opinion polls especially about, about these kinds of national values polls. Today, every country in Latin America, including Haiti, okay, including Haiti, and I'm gonna include uh, Haiti as a, has their population ranks their political institutions higher than Americans, okay? Particularly, particularly Congress. <laughs> Congress, in, in, in Dr. Seligson's poll, is, is actually ranked very high in comparison to the most recent Gallup poll, which puts Congress at about 13% support, okay? That's extraordinarily low, and I think it should lead us to, to begin to, to think a little bit about, uh, about where we are in terms of our, our institutions. And, and then the other thing when it comes to, we have some interesting religion, religion questions, and it was basically you know, self-identification. It was a demographic question. Uh, so we didn't, we weren't able to ask intensity, how Catholic are you, how this or that. But the, the values issue is, is really interesting because, and, and Jose Miguel began to sort of uh, uh, <coughs> work with that a little bit because at least I know just anecdotally from, from my own household, okay, and my wife is probably not going to be happy when I say this, but she's very Catholic and her, you know, she draws the line on on the abortion question. So so we have a very interesting marriage these days largely because of, you know, the abortion cutoff. She is extraordinarily Republican, extraordinarily pro Romney because of that particular issue and can't understand uh, you know, but she's Colombian, she's not Cuban American. So so I think what that raises, that anecdote raises the need for more and you know, more research in depth research to, to kind of get to the, those kinds of questions that you're asking, all right? 
Let me just uh -huh. jump on mm -hmm. something. There is one single value in which the uh, Latinos differentiate also uh, with, with the rest of America, and that has to, has to do with uh, the role of government. Because Latinos, in the case of uh, role of government, tend to see uh, a bigger role, a larger role of the government into their lives, and, 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 and they like that. Uh, so that might explain, to some extent, also uh, the Latinos voting more democratic than Republican, because they are more used to this, uh, you know, intervention of the government in their lives. All right, no, me, non Cubans in service. Before I go to you, let me ask. Uh, let me go back to the to the to the web here, and I have a question from Bonnie Galvez. And I, I, I know several of you uh, made this reference. She says, by future voters, do they mean the newly arrived Latinos who are slowly gaining rights or the young ones who are not 18 yet? Interesting. Who are the future Latino voters? I think it's both. I yeah. mean, uh, there's a new <laughs> generation of, of Latinos and Cuban Americans who were born and raised in this country, and of course, a growing in number and in influence. And there's also a continuing immigration of new uh, people from Latin America who are not yet uh, resident uh, uh, or, or citizenship and uh, or have acquired citizenship. So eventually, in the next uh, few elections, they will have a voice, and uh, of course, that will have an impact in the election. Great. Thank you. So, one more question. Uh, from uh, from the audience, please go ahead. Well, my name is uh, Jimmy Aker. I'm from the College of Education. I am a student, just in case, an old student. Uh, first of all, uh, I really like the poll that has been published today, and uh, I would like to make just a comment from what it was said and from the panel. Uh, first of all, when we talk about the Cubans, like uh, Dr. Derny from Puerto Rico said, uh, I am really surprised and very happy to see that the new generation is presently openly against the regularly Republican voting trend. For example, uh, national 35% go for Democrat. Uh, Florida, 37% go Democrat. So that's a big change, even that some people uh, don't try to understand that. Secondly, I really believe there's a misunderstanding on religion, Dr. Gamara. Uh, I, with Dr. Cruz, I saw the slides that you put in there. And actually, uh, we see a big tendency, a strong push for the Cuban-American sector. But I will say that the Cuban-American way of practice and see religion is very different than the Mexican-Americans. Okay. Because the Mexican-Americans and all Central America for us, religion is more social-minded. It's more social-minded. We fight for our needs and hope that the Guadalupe Virgin is, is with <laughs> us and we get a better place someday. So I would think that that, that is no uh, too correct to mention or try to say that. Uh, religion has more tendency to be conservative and republican. And one thing that I really dislike is the comment about the Cubans that will say are republicans and the vote because they are white. And uh, I will make just a little comment on that. From 1961, after Fidel came in. Who came over here? The powerful with the money, and they were whites. And you will excuse my dear Cuban Americans, but the black population and the mulatto population was just the servant of the whites in Cuba. And nobody can say otherwise. 
Now the new immigrants that are here now, I would like you to go to Walmart, to Kmart, or whatever place, or Hialeah, really Hialeah, Alapata, and North Miami. And you will see what kind of population you see this, no that way. So we have to be very careful with the comments because not all read just the Herald, and especially the Herald in Spanish, that is just mere propaganda for well, Fidel. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, interesting and provocative comments. Anybody want to, uh, would anybody want to, to respond? Just uh, on the question of race, I think it's precisely because of the kinds of changes that have been experienced by the Cuban American community that we need to factor that that issue and the question there's no there's no doubt in my mind that uh, the racial composition of the cuban american community has changed over time we don't know uh, how that uh, affects their voting patterns and the other thing i wanted to say about the uh, the difference between cubans in florida and in the rest of the united states according to the poll it's not so much a difference between the republican cubans in florida and elsewhere it's the people who are undecided and i'm looking at uh, one of the I think it's up there, uh, the large number of the 23% who are independent in Florida compared to only 5% uh, for the Cuban American vote voters in the United States. And we need to think about that. Why is it that such a large percentage of Cuban American voters here in Florida are undecided as, com as compared to the rest of the country? Okay, well, thank you so much. I I think I've taken a lot of your morning and uh, I really appreciate you coming. Again, I. I want to, uh, one more time, uh, thank the, the members of the panel. I want to acknowledge uh, Maidel Santana and, and, and Jean-Paul one more time, Ivana de Esa from, uh, from New Link, uh, and our partners at the Herald for, uh, for, uh, for this magnificent opportunity. So thank you all, and thank you for coming.